Welcome to this uh, presentation. And uh, I want to thank the Lord for his uh, mercies and uh, being with us and uh, enabling us to see another day so that uh, we may live to praise his name. Uh, I'd like to go through something uh, that concerns the understanding of uh, the covenants. And so I pray that uh, the Lord uh, will be able to help us to know what is the truth. And uh, after knowing the truth, that we shall be set free and we can be able to partake in the fellowship with the Father and uh, His Son. So I want us to pray and then um, be able to go into the presentation uh the covenants. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, glory and honor be unto thy name. And uh, I just pray that uh, you may hold these feeble instruments, including me, that uh, your word may come out clearly. Your people may be benefited by it. That uh, we may not have just knowledge, but we may have truth abiding in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. And so uh, I'm not the first person to present uh, this issue of the covenants. I know that uh, people have really delved into this uh, so much. And uh, I want just to reiterate some things. And if some information comes to us, maybe a new, then uh, uh, I will come us to be able to examine the things that uh, we shall be hearing. And that... Um, the Lord will continue blessing us. The Lord will continue instructing us in his ways. And uh, we have nothing to fear for the examination of the truth. The topic is uh, the covenants. And uh, as I said, that uh, I'm not the first one to present this. This is something that has been uh, really uh, delved in. And I'll be looking at the materials and the information we have before us. And uh, I know that uh, the Lord will lead us. Um, actually, I'll just start on this point that um, we have two covenants, and that is uh, the old covenant and the new covenant. But then uh, the issue is this, the new covenant actually is the old covenant, and the old covenant is the new covenant. What, what do I mean by that? The new covenant is called new because of... Uh, the blood of it is ratification. And um, the new covenant is what you call uh, the, the everlasting covenant. And then we have uh, the old covenant, which was made with the Israel at Mount Sinai when uh, the children of uh, Israel were coming from the land of Egypt. It is called the old covenant because it was ratified by the blood uh, of uh, the, the lamb, the typical lamb in the sanctuary. But uh, we understand that uh, the, 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 the new covenant, which is the everlasting covenant, was ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ, but was made with the, it is the covenant that kept Adam and Eve alive. It is the same covenant that uh, kept the patriarchs and the prophets alive. It is the same covenant that uh, everyone will be saved under. And even the people who are given uh, the old covenant at Mount Sinai, they went through that by faith. And it is by this uh, everlasting covenant that was ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ that uh, they are counted worthy to be the children of God. Actually, the, the two covenants also doesn't mean that... Uh, the, 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 the new covenant, we are told in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, that uh, uh, the Lord writes the law on our hearts. And then uh, that is verses, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verses uh, 10 to 11. And when you read Hebrew, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 13, that the Lord made a covenant with them, even the Ten Commandments, and he gave unto them, and it was put on the table of the stones. And so... Uh, these are the very basic things that we understand that it is the placement of the core of the law 
that uh, really is the difference between these covenants. And not only that, uh, the life that is given for those covenants. We have a covenant which is ratified by the blood of the, uh, the lamb, wherein the comers therein could not be made perfect by the blood of the ashes, the blood of the lambs, the bullocks, and all that. That is um, Hebrews uh, chapter 9, when you are reading it from verses uh, 9 downwards to verses uh, uh, 12. And then Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 1. The comers therein could not be made perfect as pertains to the conscience. But the new covenant, which is the everlasting covenant, which was ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ, Hebrews 9.14 tells us that uh, this covenant, uh, by the Holy Spirit, we uh, Jesus Christ gave him without spot. And it is the same life that uh, he gave himself without spot that he gives unto us, that experience and then we are told that um, uh, where for where there is the remission of this, there is no sin, which means that um, uh, we have to look at the covenants in in this way that uh, we had the daily, uh, the daily and the, the, the daily sacrifices uh, and uh, the yearly sacrifices. But Jesus Christ has offered him himself once and for all, and his blood is able to cleanse us from every uh, sin. And so. Uh, let, let us uh, see what uh, we can learn uh, from this. And so the standard of the new covenant is the law. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10, for this is the covenant that uh, I'll make uh, with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And uh, I'll be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And so you find that the law was written on the heart, or it is written in the heart. The standard of um, being the law in 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, for so much as ye are manifestly, manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly, fleshy tables of the heart. And so there you start getting this analogy that um, the law somehow was written on the tables of stone, but uh, in this one, the law is written on the heart. Let us uh, also see what uh, we can get from this. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but uh, of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Again, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, but if the ministration of death written and uh, engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. And so uh, it right there gives you a hint that um, somehow um, um, what um, we are calling the old covenant and it is sacrificial system was to be done away with, was to be done away with, and then a new covenant comes in where actually the law was to be written on the Parts of the people. That is, uh, the ceremonial law was uh, an emergency, or the sacrificial system was um, uh, the gospel compacted. And then, when the gospel is fully unveiled and revealed, that which was a shadow uh, must be uh, done away with, and that which is um, eternal uh, takes um, uh, supreme. And so, that is uh, how. Uh, I try to see the thing. That is how I try to see uh, what um, we are being uh, told. And then uh, uh, we are told that um, we are told that um, but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which was to be done away with. 
But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of the countenance, which glory was to be done away with, uh, for if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more do the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Second Corinthians 3.13 and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. And so you find that um, uh, that which was of Moses, that is the sacrificial system that he was given at uh, uh, Mount um, Sinai. It is not the law that is done away, but that system of approaching God was uh, to be done away. And uh, many times when you say that um, the system was to be done away, it doesn't mean that um, it doesn't have the object lessons. It, it has a very great object lesson. It is not something to be railed upon. It really opens to our understanding what those symbols meant and uh, how they perfectly fit uh, in Jesus Christ, who is um, the author and finisher of um, our faith. And so we read on that um, what was abolished, let us see it. Second Timothy 1.9, who hath saved us and called us with uh, a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And so you find there that um, the gospel unfolded is what actually bringeth life, and uh, then death is abolished. That enmity that um, is there between uh, man and God, that um, enmity that is there between man and God is done away. Because of the gospel, the gospel brings uh, immortality unto us. And what is the gospel? The gospel is simply um, the good news of Christ, that which he has done for us, that is, that is what he's doing uh, uh, for us, that is what he will accomplish in us and through us. That is the gospel. And um, when uh, you look at um, the book of um, Romans chapter 1, I'll just quickly open my Bible. Romans chapter 1, I I'd like you to see this when we are talking about the gospel. Romans chapter 1, uh, from verse 1, we read this, uh, that um, Paul, servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an uh, apostle separated unto the gospel of God that uh, Paul is a servant of God who is separated unto the gospel of God, which he has promised afore by his prophet in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God which, with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And so the gospel really encompasses the uh, unveiling and uh, the representing of Jesus Christ as the seed of David and uh, his life and his resurrection, his death, his life, his death, and his resurrection. This is the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ as the propitiation for our iniquity. So that is, what is the gospel? And then uh, Second Corinthians, um, uh, that is Second Corinthians 3, 14 and 15. But their minds were blinded for until the day remained the same veil and taken um, away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart, blinded to seeing that Christ abolished death, blinded by the glorious gospel of the cross. There, there are many who would want to go back to the shadows and not uh, partake of the reality, which is Christ in us, the hope of uh, glory. And um, uh, Christ is the end. Huh? Christ is the end of the law. 
the, the law which only demands death. In Christ, we reach its end. When you have the position of Christ in the heart, then you have the embodiment of the law. And that is the real gospel, actually. There, there are many people who would want to separate the law from Christ, but Christ is the end of the law, which means that Christ uh, is uh, the solution to what the law cannot do, because what the law can do is only condemn and bring death. But Christ then with the gospel abolishes that death. That means that the law is established in him. That which bringeth death has been conquered and that life he gives unto us. But if our gospel be hid, veiled, it is hid to them that are lost. And so can't see what Christ abolished when the reading of the Old Testament there are people who won't see that um, uh, the, um, uh, the old covenant was just a means to people to get to the Christ who is the everlasting covenant. In fact, if the people could have understood Jesus Christ, there could have not been there uh, um, the, the Mount Sinai episode. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Their minds were blinded when reading Moses, even today. So when, the, when people, and uh, you see, it is uh, something terrible that there are people who are waiting for Jesus Christ for the first time. And... Uh, they can't believe that uh, Christ came in those uh, those sacrificial system were actually done away with. They would want to continue in them. It's like waiting for Jesus Christ for the first time when actually other people are waiting for Christ for the second time. Think about that. It's uh, something to think about. And so we want to see what uh, are the differences and uh, of these covenants and what they all entail. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 371, we read the Abrahamic covenant was ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is, uh, it is amazing to read that. It is so amazing to read that. Uh, and it is called the second or new covenant because the blood by which it was sealed was shed after the blood of the first covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is the new covenant. It's the everlasting covenant. And uh, we can read in PP and uh, we will find that uh, uh, it was first made with uh, Adam. In that uh, first gospel, in the first gospel, that um, the seed of the woman shall bruise the, uh, the seed of the serpent the head of the serpent and the, the seed of the serpent shall bruise the heels of the seed of the woman. That is the first gospel to be preached. And we are talking about the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, which Paul is preaching in Romans chapter one, verses one to three, which is nothing else than preaching about Jesus Christ. So when, uh, when, um, when um, uh, Adam and Eve fell into sin, they were able to uh, be given the first gospel that is about Jesus Christ coming as uh, the propitiation. The gospel does not bring, does not come in 4 BC when Christ is born, but the gospel is preached to the first pair when they enter into the scene. And so you can see that uh, the new covenant, which is about the gospel, which is about Jesus Christ, it is not something that is coming to happen in 4 BC or um, AD 31 or AD 33 and all that stuff, but it was there even before the old covenant was, uh, or the sacrificial system was given to the children of Israel. And so you find that this is the covenant that runs from Genesis until the end of the time, and it's the basis of everyone's salvation. Uh, those people who shall be saved have to be saved by this covenant. And um, when Israel went into captivity, they were plunged into idolatry and uh, they were used to the symbols. And so the Lord uh, actually condescended or uh, limited himself to speak to his children to the, through the way that they had been used to until they become mature 
to interact with Christ himself. You see, these things of um, uh, interacting with shadows, it is something which uh, it is uh, somehow, I may say in quotes, immaturity or lack of uh, knowledge or lack of that, um, uh, what I call um, the courage to face the reality. You, you can see that when Christ came at Mount Sinai, they say that we cannot talk to him, you Moses go and talk for uh, 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 to Jesus uh, instead of us and then come and tell us what uh, you agree on and we shall do. But uh, a man who is mature, a man who is brave will be able to say to face his savior and uh, acknowledge his shortcomings and be able to be uh, um, uh, saved by him. So um, this is Abrahamic covenant and also it is the covenant with Adam. The covenant of grace was first made with man in Eden. That is uh, the covenant with Adam. It's also the new covenant. Sometimes when we are talking about faith, we, we only look at Abraham as the father of faith, but it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that, that um, uh, uh, Adam, Adam there was also saved by faith. And uh, although Abraham brings prominently what you'll call faith, but uh, it is something that was there since the, the days of uh, Adam. E.J. Wagner has to say this in uh, Present Truth of uh, United Kingdom, page uh, 356, paragraph 12, 1893, September 7. But um, as surely as Christ was slain from the foundation of the world, he was raised from the dead from the foundation of the world. For he saves uh, men by his life. Therefore, uh, Christian dispensation began for man as soon, at least as the fall. And uh, we see that first gospel in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 15. There are indeed two dispensations, a dispensation of sin and death and a dispensation of righteousness and life. But these Two dispensations have run parallel from the fall. No matter what the period of the world history, a man can at any time pass from the old dispensation into the new. Therefore, Moses was in the new dispensation. Interesting from Wagon. And so here an illustration is given, and uh, it is a good illustration. The new covenant running in parallel with the old covenant. In um, Galatians chapter 3, verse 17, and this I say that uh, the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ with Abraham, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise inheritance of one of none effect. The covenant with Abraham was still good, even though that um, the, the promise, you, you find the promises that uh, came uh, Uh, the children of Israel at Sinai cannot disannul that which was promised to Abraham or Adam or no. It cannot make void or no effect. There is no way the old covenant can uh, be uh, can replace um, the the new covenant. It, it only it, it's like uh, when uh, you are having an eclipse, you know. The, the old and the new covenant is like uh, you are having an eclipse. And uh, let me try to illustrate this. Uh, just a moment. Good. Yes, that uh, we have uh, the new covenant running from Genesis to Revelation until the probation closes. That is the everlasting covenant. And then we are having this um, uh, old covenant at uh, some period uh, overshadowing, eclipsing, so that uh, it's like you are having the old covenant or the new covenant on the back and the old covenant, it seems that it's uh, on top of it or it's eclipsing it, yet it is there and somebody can pass from this old covenant to the new covenant at any time he accepts Jesus Christ as his personal savior, in the time that he understands the gospel, then um, he can be able to pass from um, this uh, old covenant to the new covenant. It's like um, 
what we call eternity. Eternity is eclipse with um, a period there which is marked for the redemption of man. Eternity is there, it's running from eternity to eternity, but on top of it, there is this small time that is put on top of it uh, for the redemption of man, which is uh, uh, 6,000 years or 7,000 years, so we understand. And so you have this everlasting covenant running from Genesis to Revelation, but there you have an eclipse of the, uh, uh, by an eclipse by the old covenant or, yeah, what are the covenant that was given at Sinai. And so Abraham obeyed in Hebrews 11, 8, by faith Abraham obeyed. Genesis 26, 5, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So the, you wonder which covenant Abraham was living in. This is uh, the everlasting covenant. So you, you, you start understanding this new and everlasting covenant is something that was there with even Abraham and Noah and Adam. And um, what you call the old covenant actually is the new covenant, but uh, it was ratified the blood with the blood of the lamb. Now, the promise, the land of inheritance, Romans 4.13, for the promise that uh, he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, the land of promise in Hebrews chapter 11, 19. It was the promise by faith and not through the law. It is something that was there before even the law was introduced at Mount Sinai. And so you have the foundation of uh, the world, spoken law repeated at Sinai, covenant ratified, by the blood in 31 AD, and uh, then you have the new heavens and the new earth. This is um, what you call the covenant with Abraham, who still, uh, we say that it was still good. And uh, in Galatians 3, 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise, promise that he should be heir of the world. And so now here it is, uh, uh, the covenant confirmed with Abraham 430 years later, the law is given to Moses. Uh, the covenant cannot change. Galatians admonished about the covenant with Abraham, and then covenant cannot change for us even today. And so we see that um, um, even in, the, in what you call the old covenant, it was only done because that is the way God could speak to his children who were like babies and uh, they could not comprehend the full gospel. And um, when that which is perfect is come, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that which is not, that which is imperfect is done away with and it cannot uh, stand there forever and replace that which is perfect. In Galatians 3.19, wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgression. Some others translate it was spoken till the seed Christ should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. The seed in Galatians 3.16, you find that it is Christ. When will we receive the promise of inheritance uh, with Christ? First or second coming? And there are varied views about um, um, until the coming of the seed. And um, you have... Uh, uh, some of the pioneers being of uh, the, uh, the view that it is uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of the air. But um, that is not when actually the covenant is ratified. Christ's covenant is ratified when he dies on the cross. Uh, if you read in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 2, uh, chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, the Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. And so you have the two covenants, which was made with um, Abraham, Noah, it was made with also Adam. And then you have the covenant that... Um, was made at uh, Mount uh, Sinai, Mount C Sinai. And so that is the kind of illustration that uh, we have. And uh, uh, 
in Hebrews 8, 6, and 7, but now that he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of the better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been found for the second. First covenant, fault found. But uh, what was the fault? It was in the people, not even with the covenant itself. Second covenant, no fault, better promises, better covenant. And so uh, we shall continue exploring how things did not work with the, uh, the covenant at Mount Sinai, uh, where people say, all the Lord has said, we shall be able to do it. And then they came to forget that um, even their power to do what they could do was coming from Jesus Christ. In uh, Patriots and Prophets, page uh, 372, the new covenant was established upon better promises, the promise of forgiveness of sins and of the grace of God to renew the heart and bring it into harmony with the uh, principles of God's law. The same law that was engraved upon the tables of stone is written by the Holy Spirit upon the table, tables of the heart. And so we continue seeing the Abrahamic covenant, which is the new covenant, the covenant of faith, the covenant established on better promises, and the covenant of forgiveness of sin and Christ doing in us that which we cannot do. In fact, the heart of uh, righteousness by faith is um, Christ putting the glory of man in dust so that he may be able to do for him what he can do for himself and enable him to... Uh, bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of repentance to be collaborators with him in uh, righteousness. You find that, um, uh, is it uh, in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 20, so that uh, the iniquity of Israel, uh, Judah shall be sought for and it shall not be found. When you read Malachi chapter 3, we are told that um, Judah may be able to offer sacrifices of righteousness, not um, uh, uh, not of their own works. In fact, uh, that is what Paul says in uh, is it Philippians chapter 3, verses 9, that he may not be found by the righteousness which is of law, but uh, the righteousness which is of God in faith through Jesus Christ. And so man cannot labor for his salvation. It is only Christ that can give that robe of righteousness. It is... Uh, in a, in a, is it in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, that um, I'll rejoice greatly in the Lord because he has given me um, the robe of righteousness, that loom of heaven, that wedding garment. Uh, and so it doesn't have any human wand in it. Um, in Hebrews 8, 8, for finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The fault was in not in the covenant that the Lord was making with them. The fault was in the, their promises. And by the way, I, I have tried to look into this when he says that he found fault in them. What is this that he found fault in them? Because these people wanted to continue looking at the symbols. They wanted to behold the law on the stone. And they could still want Christ to speak with them through men or mediators, human instrumentalities. They, they didn't want Christ to have his rightful place so that um, he may be the mediator between man and God. They wanted somebody like them to be there as their mediator. I mean, somebody who could not offer them eternal life. And so this, this was a big problem. When you find people who are um, so much engrossed in symbols and shadows instead of the substance, they, they are like in the old covenant where God says that he found fault with them, not the promises. The promises have nothing wrong. God's ways of dealing with man has nothing, has no fault in it. Whether it be in his limited capacity where he limits himself or in his full capacity, God's way of dealing with man is okay. But then men 
would want to substitute the shadow with the real substance instead of accepting Christ and instead of accepting the realities Man, because he has fallen so short and he likes to interact with the symbols, that is what he wants throughout eternity. But uh, it cannot be like that because Christ is coming so that we may be able to interact fully with him face to face. And if we are still um, interested in these shadows instead of uh, being interested in him, then uh, it means that we shall live under the old covenant forever, yet Christ will save us through the everlasting covenant. And so it becomes so hard for uh, Christ to uh, deal with people who are only interested in the shadows. Uh, Patrick and Prophet 371 uh, to 372, God brought them to Sinai. He manifested his glory. He gave them his law with the promise of great blessings on condition of obedience. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then it shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and, uh, and a holy nation. But you find that uh, this is not something so much of a difference with what is happening in First Peter chapter 2, verses 9, that uh, you are a nation of um, priests. You are a holy nation of priests. This is what the Lord wanted the Israelites to be. He wanted all the nation to be a nation of priests, but um, they, 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 they wanted to continue to have just uh, uh, their Aaron as their high priest and all these priests ministering the daily sacrifices in the temple. Now, that becomes something hard. And so in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, the people did not realize the sinfulness of their own hearts and that uh, without Christ, it was impossible for them to keep God's law. And they readily entered into the covenant with God, feeling that they were able to establish their own righteousness. They declared all that the Lord has said, we, we said, will we do and uh, be obedient? Exodus 24, 7. But then, a little while and you find them in idolatry. They, they are not keeping what they have. They, they are not holding the end of their own bargain. Only a few weeks passed before they broke their covenant with God and bowed down to worship a graven image. They could not hope for the favor of God through a covenant which they had broken. And now, seeing their sinfulness and their need of pardon, they were brought to feel their need of the Savior revealed in the Abrahamic covenant and shadowed forth in the sacrificial offerings. Now, by faith and love, they were bound to God as their deliverer from the bondage of sin. Now, they were prepared to appreciate the blessings of the new covenant. But again, there are people who did not do that, and there are people still today who do not do that. They, they, they always stand before the Lord and say, what the Lord has said, I'll be able to do it. They forget that... Uh, Israel attempted that and uh, they were not able to do it and no one attempting it will be able to do it. And so what is the solution to all these things? Uh, the solution to all this stuff is uh, for us to accept Jesus Christ in our heart so that uh, he may work uh, his marvelous work in our hearts. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to 22, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a handmaid, the other by a free woman. Do you hear the law? Writings of uh, the Genesis. Now, it is interesting that um, Abraham himself, Abraham himself had uh, two children. And he had two wives, somehow, which illustrate how people approach God. And uh, one son, which is the eyes that we understand, was the son of faith, the son of promise, and uh, his mother also. And then we have Hagar, the, the maid, and Ishmael, which represent the old covenant, the approach by God to God by your own efforts. Now. So it means that even in the days of Abraham, this illustration was there for the people who lived at that time to understand you cannot approach God in the way Abraham approached him through Hagar. You know, it is interesting that also Abraham drifted into the old covenant when he was given the everlasting covenant, the new covenant. It, it, it's, so, it's so amazing when you read the Bible and start realizing these things. Abraham is given the new covenant. Through Isaac, I shall give you everything. 
through Isaac, I shall establish you. Through Isaac, then I shall bring you to the land of inheritance. And then a few days later, Abraham, who has received everlasting covenant, what does he do? The wife suggests for him the old covenant where you approach God by your works. And then she gives her Hagar. And Sarai is like, uh, okay, um, not of age. I have gone through my menopause. I have no desire for any man. And uh, I have no desire for intimacy even. Not only by the way did uh, Sarah mean that she has gone through her menopause. When you read her words so well, it means that she had no desire for intimacy at all. It, it was gone, all, all gone through uh, by the age that she was. And then she gives out Hagar and then tells uh, Abraham, through Hagar you shall be blessed. Let, let us have a child. And then you have uh, uh, Ishmael coming out. And then uh, this is Abraham entering into the co old covenant. And uh, the Lord asked him, what is this? At the end of the day, Ab Abraham had to cast out Ishmael. He had to do away with this old covenant and come under the new covenant, which God had given unto him, because that is the only system that he could save Abraham through, through faith and not approaching him through his own works. And so look again at Isaac. The child is gotten by faith. It is no by, uh, uh, I think, uh, by interposition of man, but only God intervenes in all these affairs. And uh, the child is the doing of God and not the doing of man. Okay. Again, we continue. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 23, but he who was of the born woman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, born again by the word of God. First Peter 1, 23, we must be born again if we shall be able to enter to the new covenant. And so Galatians 4, 24, which things are an allegory for these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which uh, generates to bondage, which is um, Agar, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. And uh, this is uh, a representation of uh, the child of promise. Yes. In uh, Galatians 4, 28 and 29, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But uh, as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. As then, even as now. Interesting. It is interesting as then, as now. There are people who will want to hold the old covenant. There are people who will want to hold unto the shadows. And then they go persecuting the free uh, children. They, they like to impose all these things on them. You, you, you must do this to enter the kingdom of God and you must do this. I'm not talking even about the fruit of the spirit, which comes by um, the indwelling of the spirit of Christ in us. I'm talking about these things that people say that, uh, oh, uh, you must do this in order to be in favor with God and you must do this to be able to get in favor with God. These are some of the things that you find in uh, the Galatian church where circumcision was being imposed on the people. If you are not circumcised, then you shall not be saved. And uh, the people are in these many things where actually they want you to approach God the way they know, not, with, not the way that uh, the Bible says that you should approach God. And when you are, try to approach God the way the Bible says, then as it was then, now it happens again, persecution. In Galatians chapter 3, 4, verses 30, 31, Nevertheless, what said the scripture, cast out the bond woman and her son, for the son of the bond woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. That is it. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bond woman, but of the free, not of the old covenant, not heirs. The promise. Galatians 5, 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What does Christ, what does Christ make us free? 
from, we ask ourselves in John chapter 8, verse 34 and 36, Jesus answered them, Very, very, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin in this, is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Or ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free. Slaves are cast out, there is no inheritance. The son are born again, they have the kingdom of God. In Galatians 4 7, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, but if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And so uh, we see that repeated over and over again. In John 8 37, I know that you are Abraham's seed. But you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen my father, which I have seen with my father. And you do that which you have seen with your father. And this, this your father is not referring to Abraham. He says, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. And uh, Abraham really showed his acceptance of salvation by grace, by faith, by uh, giving Isaac to represent the coming of Jesus Christ and offering of the blood of the Son of God. And so... Uh, this is what the Jewish could not accept, that Christ could die for their sins, and they, they crucified the Messiah. Why did they crucify the Messiah? Because of their own misunderstanding of uh, the two covenants. You are of your father the devil, John 8, 24, and the last of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and a father it. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby you cry, Abba, Father. And because ye are sons, God has sent the forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Searching what of the man of the time, the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now, um, the priests and the old Jewish nation, they wanted to approach God through the sacrifices of uh, the lamb. The lamb that did not have experience, the lamb that did not have life to cleanse the conscience. They refused Jesus Christ, who is the life, who had the experience of a sin, and who was the embodiment of that sanctuary they were saying they are following to exactness. It is even amazing that we find that um, Christ who was revealed in the shadows of the sanctuary, he was rejected by the men who had the sanctuary. And it's even today, men are uh, uh, refuse Jesus Christ and uh, they accept something else so that um, uh, you wonder how people are different this time from uh, the Pharisees of the old. They will not want the spirit of Christ so that uh, they may be on a board of the Shekinah of glory of God. They would like to approach God in symbols. In Romans 9, 4, 5, who are Israelites to whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers? Whose are, are the fathers and whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all? God bless them forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath not taken none effect. For they are not Israel, which are Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham uh, are they all children, but in Isaac shall they see the seed be called. And so in Romans chapter 9, verse 8, that these, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And so you can see an illustration of. Um, the child of the bond woman persecuting the child, the free woman. But then this 
the child of the bond woman is cast away and then uh, the child of uh, uh, the promise has that freedom which is everlasting and uh, let us look at then what about the children called out of Egypt? And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Were they all God's children, or was this God's calling to them? He says, Let my people go. Now, you understand that uh, not only Israel, came from Egypt, but also the, the mixed multitude. And God gave them a chance to be children of, of freedom, every one of them. But uh, the Israelites and the Egyptians, all of them perished in the wilderness because they could not accept the terms of God. Uh, at a certain time, you found that the mixed multitude with the Israel wanted to go back to Egypt because um, Moses had tarried long in the, in the mount. And so what do they want? Instead of uh, accepting Christ by faith, they would want an image to be made for them to go back to Egypt. Immediately, you start making images as a representation of the reality you are going back to Egypt. That is what is happening in the book of Exodus. I know it can be so straight uh, that you may wonder about it, but um, when you have to forget about the reality, when you have to forget about approaching God the way the Bible wants you to approach him by faith and go back to symbols and go back to shadows and go back to the things which Christ has made as an antitype, then you are no different from this mixed multitude and the Israelites who want to make an image. And where are they going back? They are not going to Canaan when they are making this image. They are saying, make us gods that we may go back to Egypt. For this Moses, we don't know about him. What has happened him in the mount? We don't know about it. So make us an image that we may go back to Egypt. This is how people are, many churches are involved in this. And even you find that uh, the church that uh, has been given the truth will want to approach God in a way that uh, the mixed multitude and the children of Israel wanted to approach him. And so let my son go that he may serve me. But... Um, uh, that is, Pharaoh didn't want to do anything, uh, didn't want these children to go free. And so uh, it made these people, many of them missed the blessings and only, uh, and only that is uh, Joshua and Caleb were able to enter into the promised land. They were able to enter into the Canaan land. It is dangerous to approach God in what has been abolished. I, I, I think that we will think about this more and more, that um, it may sink into our hearts as we look into this, that uh, it is dangerous to approach God in that which has been uh, done away. Uh, still continuing to look at PP 71, but if the Abrahamic covenant contained the promise of redemption, why was another covenant formed at Sinai? In their bondage, the people had to a great extent, lost the knowledge of God and of the principles of the Abrahamic covenant. So the Abrahamic covenant, the promise of redemption, but the people in their adultery, they uh, came to forget uh, about um, this. They came to forget uh, about this. Yes, if uh, the Israelites had obeyed God's requirement, they would have been practical Christians. They would have been happy. For they will have been keeping God's ways and not following the inclinations of their own natural hearts. Moses did not leave them to misconstrue the words of the Lord or to misapply his requirements. He wrote all the words of the Lord in a book that they might be referred to afterward. In the mount he had written them as Christ himself dictated them. So there you have it in uh, Sermons and Talks, Volume 2. Uh, 
uh, page 188, paragraph 3, that uh, these people could have become practical Christians. Now, what is Christians? A people who have Christ in them, a people who have allowed Christ in their life by faith. But these people wanted to have just the lamb, the daily sacrifice, the morning and the evening, looking at the lamb and shedding the blood. In fact, when um, you read the book of um, Romans chapter um, Romans chapter 9, we are told that they didn't mingle faith in this. And so the Gentiles who have not, who have followed Christ, not as the Israelites did with the law, have attained to the law of righteousness, but the Israelites who followed him after the law have missed because they did not approach him by faith. So many of them missed actually the land of Canaan and only two ended in it. It's a, it is something to uh, really make us be afraid how we read these things and uh, how they continue affecting uh, how we approach a um, uh, heavenly father. Okay. Um, in Romans 9, 31 and 32, but Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. This is what I'm saying, that um, they could have been practical Christian. What is a practical Christian? A person who does things by faith, not by works. Deuteronomy 5, 2, 3, the Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us even who are of all of us here alive today. And so we have the two covenant, one with Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And then uh, we are having the one which he made uh, with uh, the children of Israel. We have a covenant made uh, uh, with uh, one with Abraham, Isaac, and uh, another one with uh, Israel at Mount Sinai. Now, take a look at uh, this. The new covenant, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, sons born of spirit, sons of Abraham, seed, Israel. Then the old covenant, Israelites at Sinai, Ishmael, Pharisees, and Esau, slaves born of flesh. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold what man of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of Israel, children of God are manifest in the children of the devil. Whosoever doth, doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. This is a promise that um, uh, we commit, that's not, uh, we commit ourselves to the Lord. There's no committing of sin, but we commit ourselves to the Lord. And what does this have to do with the covenants? I, I, I like just to reiterate what um, I had said before. That is, uh, let us look at the book of Hebrews chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter, uh, the book of Hebrew, uh, Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter, Nine, Hebrews chapter nine, and uh, look at verse uh, eight, Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter nine, verses eight. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that uh, the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing, the first tabernacle had to do with the old covenant and the sacrificial system. Now, the Holy Ghost had not signified about um, the, the original uh, tabernacle, or the original uh, sanctuary. Now, this old tabernacle, or the first tabernacle, that is the tabernacle in the wilderness, verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, that uh, could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So the service is made in the, 
the services made in the first tabernacle that uh, tabernacle that was given for sacrificial system could not make the commas there imperfect. It was only the revelation of Jesus Christ when he had um, offered his blood once and for all that we are told that um, in verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now, if you jump to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the commas there unto perfect. It is only through Christ that uh, perfection is found and uh, the children of Israel didn't want to go unto this perfection because they wanted always to have these symbols with them and to approach God on their own terms. And this could not make their conscience clean because all they could continue with is um, the morning and the evening sacrifices while the Lord wanted to offer the yearly one where actually sin was eradicated once and for all, once and for all. Um, but this is the message that uh, ye have heard from the beginning that we should love one another, not as kind who was of that wicked one and slew his son brother and wherefore slew him he him because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous now how did uh, Cain approach God you know very well that uh, God said bring the lamb as a sign that you accept the blood of the redeemer but he brought his grains he came to God according to his own works and then Abel brought the lamb that uh, he was told to bring, and then uh, he was accepted because he recognized Christ, the everlasting covenant, uh, which was the covenant by faith, looking unto Jesus Christ, the author and finish of our faith. But Cain could only look unto his work, and he saw that uh, his harvest was so good. And then what next? He was a slave, and he will remain a slave forever, while Abel is the son of God. Hebrews 11, 24, what covenant did even Moses himself who gave the sanctuary, who was the sanctuary was given through, which covenant did he live in? Hebrews 11, 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. The fruit of the spirit is faith. Everyone in Hebrews 11 is under the new covenant because it is the whole, the chapter of the whole of the fame uh uh the those uh, those uh, those tall words of faith and uh, coincidentally conspicuously incidentally and blessingly Moses appears in that uh, hall of fame that he lived under new covenant although that he was given the sanctuary and the tabernacle Actually, Abraham lived under the new covenant. It's so interesting, so interesting. Hebrews 7, 1 and 2, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, king and a priest. It is interesting to find people say that, oh, you shall not give tithe, because we are under new covenant, the tithe was for old covenant. Yet Abraham gave a tithe under a new covenant. Think about that also. That um, uh, to reject the giving of the tithes and offering, it is rejecting the new covenant. And uh, uh, there are many people who reject to give tithes and offering. There are these people are not even under old covenant. They are not under new. They are not under old because in the old there is tithes for the priest, and also in the new there is tithes, which Abraham lived under. And so, ask yourself which covenant do you belong to if um, you really argue with these things. Uh, God wanted to make the children of Israel a nation of priests, not one person. Exodus chapter nineteen verse six. And it shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But uh, then they didn't enter into that which God wanted to establish 
with them. And so you find that the same thing God wanted to establish with them in Exodus 19 is the very same thing he does with his children in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that we have become a kingdom of priests, a nation of priesthood. He says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And uh, how is this done? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, we are told that um, we become lively stones building a spiritual house by putting away the old man, every malice, every wickedness. Overcoming sin is the basis of new covenant, by the way. The old covenant, it is just confession, repentance, bringing a lamb. Confession, repentance, and bringing a lamb. And so many of us are living in that covenant where actually we delight to sin again and bring a sacrifice. Delight to sin again and bring a sacrifice. Such a life is a life of old covenant. It's not a life of a new covenant. The life of a new covenant, we are told, the Holy Spirit purges you from unholy work so that you may offer uh, yourself uh, without a spot. Uh, and so... In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22, by so much was Jesus made a surety of better testament. How is that uh, 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 covenant better? Um, we, read in, uh, we read in Romans chapter 2 how that covenant is even the best covenant to ever have. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of man, but of God. This is the real entering into the new covenant. And uh, we are not just called to be Seventh-day Adventists by uh, having the Sabbath, the dress reform, and doing all these outward things so that people may see us as the Jew used to circumcise children of eight days old to show just that the child was a Jew. Uh, and so we, we we are in this religion of do's and don'ts, where you shall dress this, you shall eat this, and you shall do this so that uh, you may appease an angry God. That is not the situation, friends. Under the new covenant, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The, we should be having a balanced um, presentation of what is a new covenant and how it differs with the old covenant, where people actually come there, you know, when somebody sinned in the old covenant, the, the, some, I, I may say, some didn't even bother about repenting and all that. So long as they had brought the lamp in the sanctuary, then uh, it could be to deceive the people, oh, now I'm righteous with, before God because you see, I have brought the lamp. And some of us, we dress so well and we eat so well and uh, all this stuff. And so the people can say, we have the praises of men. Oh, see, so and so he's dressing just as a seventh day Adventist. He's eating as a seventh day Adventist. Well, actually, the circumcision of the heart is missing. It is only the circumcision of um, the Jew for us. So we are told it's not by outside. So, what advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them who are committed the oracles of God. Um, and that is the only thing they can rejoice in, but nothing else. Um, the light on the covenants in TM 91 and 92. The Lord in his great mercy. Um, interesting. The Lord in uh, his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world, the afflicted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the world, whole world. It presented justification through faith. In the surety, it invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Now I tell you here before God that the covenant question as it has been presented is the truth. Now the previous one is TM 91, 92, and this is um, this is a sermon March 8, 1890 at Battle Creek. 
We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way of the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. That is uh, Life Sketches, page 196. New covenant given to Adam and Eve, the covenant of grace was first made with man in Eden, Patriarchs and Prophet, page 371. And so, wickedness was so widespread that God said, I'll destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. You find that um, this man was able also to enter into the new covenant with the Lord. That is um, the man uh, Noah in his time. So um, we find that uh, at any time we can drift into the old covenant, at any time we can drift into the new covenant. And so as soon as there was sin, there was a savior. Christ knew that he would have to suffer, yet he became man substitute. And so um, as soon as Adam sinned, the son of God presented himself as a surety for the human race with just as much power to avert the doom pronounced upon the guilty as when he died upon the cross of Calvary. This is Revy and Herald, March 12, 1901. Uh, and then uh, we have MS uh, 43B. And uh, this is interesting. We are told um, there is uh, the priesthood of Christ commenced. The priesthood of Christ commenced as soon as man had sinned. He was made a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And uh, we understand that uh, this is the um, this is uh, the everlasting covenant, the new covenant being spoken about only to be ratified with the blood of Jesus Christ at uh, Calvary. In DA 210, paragraph 2, as soon as there was sin, there was a savior. He was given light. He has given light and life to all, and according to the measure of light given, each is to be judged. So from Adam to the last person to be saved, it is only the precious blood of Jesus Christ that really saves him. You know that uh, precious light has shone forth in connection with the law of God as the righteousness of Christ has been presented with the, that law. Dr. Wagona has opened to you precious light, not now, not new, but all light which has been lost sight by many minds and is now shining forth in clearance, the 1888 materials, page 174. Um, the two views of the covenant. There is a creation. That covenant, they run simultaneously. And uh, the 1888 controversy was centered also upon these issues. Um, the council was between the father and the son in eternity before even an angel was created. Um, should sin and afterward the plan was made before Zechariah 6, 13 and 14. It was given to Adam in, in Eden, was given to Abraham, was offered to the Israelites, but they refused. After rejecting it, they are ready to accept the new covenant, was ratified by Christ at the cross. And so we see these covenants uh, running parallel. Um, Ryan Smith, in letter to E.G. White, February 17, 1890, we read, as it looks to me next to the death of Brother James White, the greatest calamity that ever befell our uh, course was when Dr. Wagner put his articles on the book of Galatians through the signs. I suppose the question of the law in Galatians was settled way back in 1856. I was surprised at the articles because they seemed to be to me then and still seem to me to contradict so directly what you wrote to J. H. Wagner. This is Uriah Smith to E.J. to E.G. White. The position in Galatians, which I deem as erroneous, he, Wagner, took his position in Galatians, the same which you had condemned in his father, Wagner. And so the, the, this, this issue about the law in Galatians, either if it is moral and uh, or it is some. Uh, a ceremonial, and which one is a schoolmaster uh, to bring us unto Christ? 
But uh, let us hear the response that uh, is given with EG White. Night before, last I was, I was shown that evidence in regard to the covenant was clear and convincing. Yourself and others are spending your investigative powers for naught to produce a position on the covenants to vary from the position that Brother Wagner has presented. Had you received the true light which shineth, you would not have initiate, imitated or gone over the same manner of uh, interpretation and misconstruing the scripture as did the Jews. The covenant question is a clear question and will be received by every candid and prejudiced mind. But I was brought where the Lord gave me an insight into this matter. You have turned from plain light. And so you find here Uriah Smith is um, having a problem with the covenants as being presented by uh, E.J. Wagoner. Although E.G. White did not agree everything that Wagoner said, but the light on the covenants, she agreed with it. Um, I can presume she was not agreeing with him until the seed, the coming of the seed, which is the second coming, because um, I have this view also that it is the first coming. But uh, Rice Smith had a problem with that. Uh, the president, Butler, had a problem with that on the covenants. And it's something worthy of investigating what happened in 1888, because... Uh, Sometimes you find that these controversies that we are having even now are the same controversies they had. And because we are so naive of uh, our history, we are bound to repeat the same. The people who don't know their history will repeat the same history. Uh, and so let us be not naive of knowing what is our history. You have strengthened the hands and minds of such a man as Larson, Porter, Dan Jones, Elry, and Morrison, and Nicola, and a vast number through them. All quote you and the enemy of righteousness looks on pleased E.J. White to Uriah, who was opposing the truth about the covenant. If you turn from one ray of light fearing, it will necessitate an acceptance of positions you do not wish to receive. That light becomes to you darkness, that if you are in error, you will honestly assert it to be truth. Again, this is um, to Uriah Smith, March 8, 1890, Battle Creek Letters, Michigan Letter 59. Again, we read in uh, E.G. White letter to W. White and Mary White, I am much pleased to learn, to learn that Professor Prescott is giving the same lessons in his class to the students that Brother Wagona has been giving. He is presenting the covenants. Since I made the statement last Sabbath that the view of the covenants as it had been taught by Brother Wagona was truth, it seems that uh, great relief has come to many minds. Interesting. Uh, she says this to um, Willie White uh, in March 9, 1890. Uh, also found in uh, 1888 materials, page 617. I have no brakes to pull to put on now. I stand in perfect freedom, calling light, light, and darkness, darkness. I told them yesterday that the position of the covenants, I believe, as presented in my volume one, Patriarchs and Prophets. If that was Dr. Wagner's position, then he had the truth, and we have read what she had wrote in uh, PP. The light that came to me night before last night, it all laid it all open again before me, just the influence that was at work and just where it will lead. You are just going over the very same ground that they went over in the days of Christ. You have had the, the experience, but God deliver us. You have stood right in the way of God, the earth is to be lightened with his glory. And if you stand where you stand today, you might just as quick say that the spirit of God was the spirit of the devil. Do not hang on to Brother Smith. In the name of God, I tell you, he is not in the light. He has not been in the light since he was at Minneapolis. Let the truth of God come into your hearts. Open the door. Now I tell you here before God that the covenant question as it has been presented is the truth as we try to wrap this up. The covenant of grace was at first made with man in Eden. This same covenant was renewed to Abraham. This promise pointed to Christ. So Abraham understood it. See Galatians 3, 8 and 16. And he trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. It was this faith that was accounted unto him for righteousness. The covenant with Abraham also maintained the authority of God's law. Interesting. So, the people who say that um, they are um, 
under the new covenant, they also have to embrace the law. They have to not tremble on the law by saying that we are under the new covenant, we are under grace. So it doesn't matter. The law has been taken away and all we have is Christ in us. The law has nothing. Yes, you may say the law has nothing, but I tell you it is the foundation of God's government. It is a transcript of his character. Um, and it reveals who the creator is, who the sustainer is, and uh, who giveth life. Uh, and uh, Christ says that he has not come to abolish the law, but he has come to establish it. So let us see as uh, we bring this to an end. Um, what did E.G. White write in um, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, that is uh, Patriarchs and Prophets? We reread it, we have read it, and we reread it in the ending as we go through the last three slides. Another compact called in the scripture, the old covenant was formed between God and Israel at Sinai and was then ratified by the blood of a sacrifice. The Abrahamic covenant was ratified by the blood of Christ. But if the Abrahamic covenant contained the promise of redemption, why was another covenant formed at Sinai? In their bondage, the people had to a great extent lost the knowledge of God and of the principle of the Abrahamic covenant. In delivering them from Egypt, God sought to reveal to them his power and his mercy that they might be led to love and trust him. He brought them down to the Red Sea where, pursued by the Egyptians, escape seemed impossible that they might realize their utterless helplessness, their need of divine aid, and then he wrote deliverance for them. They could not pass the Red Sea by their own, by the way. Thus they were filled with love and gratitude to God and with confidence in his power to help them. He had bound them to himself as their deliverer from temporal bondage. Living in the midst of adultery and corruption, they had no true conception of the holiness of God, of the exceeding sinfulness of their own hearts, their utter inability in themselves to render obedient to God's law and their need of, savior, of a savior. All this they must be taught. Again, you find that. God brought, God brought them to Sinai. He manifested his glory. He gave them the, his law with the promise of great blessing on condition of obedience. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The people did not realize the sinfulness of their own hearts and that without Christ, it was impossible for them to keep God's law. And they readily entered into a covenant with God, feeling that uh, they were able to establish their own righteousness. They declared all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. They never thought about saying that um, Okay, then uh, God give us the strength to do that which you want us to do. But um, then uh, what they did was to say that all the Lord has said we will do. And this uh, has been uh, the trouble ever since. Man will um, somehow want to approach God. Uh, he would want to approach God on uh, the basis of performance. You know that? They think that God is seated somewhere and he has a scale where he puts your own works of the law and then he puts to another scale your sins. And so the scale of your own works or your righteousness seems that it is way, uh, outweighing your sin and then you, you do not get to heaven. And then... Uh, Sometimes on the, on the scales of the balance, you find that um, your sins are much more than your works of the law. And so then you are condemned. There, there's a way people view God when it comes to this um, issue of sin. Either you are doing so good and your sins are so little. And so we have these two scales that you are approaching God with. So God, just look at how my works are so many good. Even if I have stumbled a little bit here, but check on my righteousness, it exceeds this uh, little sin that I have committed. And so you have to just take me to heaven because you see my works are just outweighing my sins. 
This is um, how people approached God somehow in the old covenant. That, um, and you find the Pharisees doing a lot of things, tithing even the cumin and the things that some, some people will not even tithe. And they, they saw that their righteousness was exceeding their sins. And so they were entitled to heaven and the praises of men. And as many as you brought the lambs to be sacrificed, that is how much you became good with God. You see, such a kind of viewing salvation, it's a clash between the two covenants where actually nothing good in my hands I bring. Uh, I come to the fountain that I be washed. I come before the Lord that I be washed. That is the new covenant. That is the everlasting covenant. There's nothing good you can carry in your hands before the Lord. But under this old covenant, all the Lord has said we will do. And so you find people like the rich young fool. He says that from my youth, I have done this. And then Christ tells him, he says that go and sell what you have and give to the poor. And the man goes away so sorrowful because he didn't have heart religion. He had this physical religion where he was so good to in the outward semblance. But what was going on in his heart? really had nothing to do with everlasting covenant. A question that you should ask yourself and I should ask myself, is it that um, we are also, we have uh, drifted into this uh, issue of uh, the old covenant and the new covenant where actually we are approaching God as uh, the children of Israel in Romans chapter nine approached God without faith, but with their works outperforming the, their salvation, and then uh, seeing that they should be accepted before God. What is the balance in this? It is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves, and then giving us his righteousness. And if you abide in him, you bear much fruit. Remember, it is abiding in him so that he may reproduce. Where is our place in this whole thing, our place is surrender and be a vessel, a channel for the blessings. We are not to work the spirit. The spirit is to work us. And so we are told that the heart of righteousness by faith is this. After you have done all that you have done, you are still unprofitable servant. There is it. And say that we have only done that which you have bid us to do and what you have enabled us to do. It is not a quarrel with God that I have outdone this. I have done this in my strength and all that. We are, yes, to bring the fruit and uh, the works of repentance because you are saved by grace unto good works. So that grace brings in the good works. The grace of God has appeared unto all men, Titus uh, 2 verses 11 teaching them to deny ungodliness. So this grace is a lesson. It's a strength on its own. And that grace is the spirit of Christ. It is the power, the unmerited favor that man cannot get by performing. It is only a favor from God so that you may be able to yield unto him and do what you can do. And so it is upon us, everyone of us, to ask ourselves, how have we been approaching God? and then. May the Lord help us and uh, may he continue renewing us and helping us understand his will in our life. Uh, shall we pray in uh, uh, closing this and I know the Lord will bless us. Heavenly Father, once again, glory and honor be unto thy name. Receive honor and glory. As we continue studying your word, may we be attracted to the lovely image of thy son, Jesus Christ. And may we be turned into the same image. Thank you for your grace and thank you for your love. And uh, bless us even as we fellowship uh, together this Sabbath. And uh, let the promises of uh, the new covenant, Lord, which is established on better promises, be our portion in this life. We pray these things believing that uh, you hear us and you will answer us. And Lord, you will help us to overcome every sin. And Lord, that we may be presented before you without fault. 
by the life of thy son. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, may um, the blessings of the Lord be with us and uh, may he continue guiding us into all truth. Bye for now.